Thanks. Welcome to Minecraft. Oh yeah, today is the 18th of August. So, uh, our, I'm just going to say um for like 20 minutes. How about that? Our agenda for today is synopsis of the watchdog service. Uh, Chris Bear has some wake word schema changes. Uh, and uh, we've got the 2008 launch coming up. And uh, talk about our canonical snap package and if, um, how we're going to continue to support that. So, uh, as a result of our discussion last week, Chris Bear had uh, written up a Excuse me, I got distracted. Um, written up a uh, summary of what we would want out of this watchdog service um, from a high level, and uh, the idea is to use that to evaluate the current um, implementation uh, in, the, in the form of the pull request and see if uh, we can get from here to there uh, using that system. Um, so uh, I have not personally had a chance to review that proposal. Has anyone else? Des has? Okay, great. I have not. Okay. Um, we, so Where is it at? Did we get an email with it or something? I posted a link to it in Dev Team. Dev Team, okay. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, what I was thinking that the service would do. So, um, oh, so you're in agreement with it for the most part? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can kind of just throw this up on the screen real quick there. So can yeah, share that with yeah. everyone. Take my face well, off of me. I don't know if this is actually legible in the video share, but um, I don't think you need to share it. I have it up on my screen. I think anybody can bring it up. Well, I'm talking about for our viewers at home. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, like this video if you're watching from home. No, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, can you give me uh, give us give us your impressions? Do you, what do you think uh, with respect to you know Chris's uh, proposal and what we're doing now. Does, did these things fit together or? Uh, well, yeah, so my, my read of the proposal is it's, it's the high level, you know, functionality and uh, there wasn't anything that jumped out at me as, as missing or anything. So I think that's exactly what we want. We want an external service to, to you know, be able to query and for services to be able to um, be restarted and all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, this was the intent behind. This was where the the process status was was heading towards. Um, I thought uh, so. You know, in terms of um, uh, the the status messages themselves, like you know, is the service running? Is it healthy? Is it ready? Uh, I guess healthy is a healthy and ready is is got the same you know there's always qualifications there about what does that mean for each service and it might differ from service to service um, in the same way with current messages are you know what what is a live what started versus a live versus ready. Well, we should um, we should regularize the definitions for those things. The specifics will be different for sure, but hmm. we should be able to make guarantees about what those status messages mean um, yeah, in a uniform agree, way. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just mean within the service itself. Like you know, for the skill service to be ready, you know, presumably that means that all the skills are trained and you know that it's right. Yeah. Actually, actually, ready to respond to things, and which is really <coughs> the audio service and stuff. But, but in terms of what that means to the external monitoring service, it should be consistent. Yes. Um, right. Okay. 
So can we basically just cut and paste this into a new um, documentation page and mark this as you know part of our roadmap? And uh, the current PRs could just reference, you know, be basically any documentation in those PRs could be a sub part of the same documentation page. And we'll just mark which parts of this are actually implemented and which parts are TBD. Yeah, the, the one thing that is currently implemented in the PR that's different than this, and we have to figure out how we want to change it, is um, the enclosure right now. Well, we're, first of all, the message bus doesn't emit a status or do anything with the status because um, it's assumed it's needed to be able to do that. And then the enclosure also assumes a status instead of emitting one. Um, so, you know, it, like the enclosure right now is what is deciding whether or not the, the whole entire core is ready. Um, when in this case, I would think this service would be able to make that determination instead um, right. by well, including that the enclosure and the, and the message bus in the uh, calculation of whether or not everything's ready. I think yeah, that, I think uh, I, you know, the goal of the current PR is not to implement the service as you've described, but, you know, implement some parts of it. And as long as it's not going to interfere with us implementing this stuff down the road, I think we should go ahead with it. If there's any changes to the system that we need, to, uh, you know, at a core level, then let's see if we can get those done. But if, you know, if they haven't implemented this service for the message bus, um, uh, then that, I don't think that should necessarily keep us from going forward because we're not implementing the system D, you know, watchdog right now anyway, right? This is just a step along that path. Yeah, I kind of saw it as a step, as a stepping stone towards an external service. And so, you know, rather than generate a new service without knowing what we really wanted that to look like. Um, that's why we, you know, put it in the, it seemed like the enclosure was the best place that currently existed for it to live. Um, and then, yeah, the, didn't add uh, a check on the message bus just because if the messages were getting through, then the message bus must be alive. And if they weren't, then clearly it's crashed. Um, and there's no, uh, it, it didn't add any new watchdogs or anything like that. So there's, you know, um, it, purely around status. Um, uh, but it's also, it doesn't have any breaking changes in it that I can recall. Um, so, uh, and it shouldn't break anything if we then remove things from there and shift it to an external service, I don't think. Right. Uh, so I think we should post this documentation to the community and uh, get their input on it. Um, make sure that you know the implementers are willing to sign off on like on the idea that yes, you know what these changes of this pull request will serve as a good basis for implementing the system that you know the ultimate system that we've envisioned here, or whatever caveats they might want to. Make. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so to be clear, we're not going to go ahead and accept the pull request just yet until you know we get this nailed down. But um, there's still some code review changes I need to go through too. Right. Okay. Um, um, so but I also thought it could wait until. The 28.8.1 20. release. Okay. Given it's not a breaking change. Okay, cool. So, so there's no urgency in with respect to getting it into the 2008. Yeah, I thought so. Unless, okay. unless Chris, if, if there's any, if you do spot anything you think would be a breaking change, then flag that. But. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's segue right into the 2008 discussion then. Uh, uh, yep. Um, I don't know if people have had a chance to take a look, but I um, set up a sprint for 20, 2008 um, and another one for 20.8.1. Um, I 
essentially, you know, given we're trying to get everything in by this Friday um, to give us uh, a week of testing um, before doing a release, I thought it would be best to to be relatively strict on um, keeping this release for breaking changes and then can push anything that is not a breaking change, uh, you know, or, you know, bug fix or anything like that. Um, things that are additions, feature requests, um, pushing that out to, to the point release. Um, so, uh, I, you, Inboxes probably saw that I got a few PRs in yesterday, um, uh, which leaves us with only half a dozen things um, that I want to try and get in before the end of the week. Uh, um, it's mostly removing deprecated things that have been deprecated for up to three years, um, but just we haven't made the time to go in and and actually finish pulling them out. Um, uh, there's a few third-party deprecated libraries like the, the imp module that um, we need to transfer over to import lib, um, which we did a bit of previously, but it's not, not uh, completely gone. Um, uh, there was some Voight comp stuff that we um, dropped into skills as a sort of um, uh, polyfill, you know, bridging kind of uh, functionality. Um, well, we made sure that there was functionality actually in Minecraft Core, so pulling those out. Um, the one that I haven't really looked at at all yet is this extract log level setting from echo function. Um, I think essentially it's it's. I haven't looked at it, but I, I think it's like setting the, the log level in a strange way. Um, and I'm not sure that we're going to get time to, to do that in this release, um, just because I don't know what's required to, I haven't, I haven't mapped out how we might want that to look properly. Um, and it seems like a, you know, something that if it's working at the moment, I'd rather just leave it working then move to an unknown change very quickly. Um, anyway, so if there's if you have any thoughts on that, it's all in the that sprint. Um, Do you have uh, release notes that you're you're compiling over time? Uh, I haven't started the release notes. No. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I generally just do those from the. I try and be as descriptive as. as as descriptive as possible in my um, pull requests mm -hmm. so that I can go back and just copy and paste those out to become the release notes. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you look at commits since the last release, then that, that's the release notes. <laughs> uh, but I can I can pull those together into and, and sort of update them as I go. Um, and then for the point release, uh, the things that um, I thought we could hold back was the refactoring of the intent service. That was a pretty major refactor. Um, I think it needs a, a solid, you know, real world testing before we try and push that. But it, it shouldn't change functionality. Um, you know, any major refactor is going to have little, uh, little changes. So uh, there's the process status class. If we if we move forward with that, there's the skill API, which is allowing skills to expose their methods to other skills. Um, there's the plugin system that you know just didn't didn't feel like it was um, right to try and brush that in. Um, I think we'll get it. We'll get it in early in twenty point eight, and then remove any of the excess services um, for twenty one point two. Uh, and then there's some uh, common play skill um, things that 
particularly Jarvis and and well, particularly Jarvis <laughs> is working on, um, yeah, which I uh, I think can all wait until the point release. So to be clear, the the point release, um, the di difference between the the 08 and the 08.1 release will be that in the 08 release we may have changes that break uh, certain skills or um, other things that you know if somebody is using our code base uh, for something the, the API interfaces may be changing in there right yep yeah okay uh, but in the 2008.1 those kinds of changes will not happen between the 2008 release and the point one release correct they won't happen until 20 2001. 20, no, 2102. 2102. Right. 2102. Right. Got it. Okay. That's, that's what I, that was my understanding. Just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. It just came up because some of the things that you described, uh, like the skill API and the plugin system, sound like things that are might be kind of a big deal, but I guess not. Uh, I guess they don't break anything. Well, I think, I think they're a big deal, but they add functionality. They, don't, they shouldn't break anything. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, we're not talking about changing some of our. I thought we were talking about changing some of our, uh, you know, modules to be plugins rather than core. Is that something we would introduce in twenty one oh two? Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, we can we can put the plugin system in for now, but leave all of the existing services in there. So it means that people can add new plugins, um, right. and we can get our stuff ready as plugins, but they wouldn't actually be removed from the code base until. The next major release, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, great. Anybody have any questions about the upcoming major release? Nope. Anyone out there in the audience? No. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, I also started a twenty-one point two, twenty-one oh two sprint for uh, okay. six months time, just so that when there are things that um, we do want to pull out, then we can keep a, a list of them. As well as our beautiful comments in code. <laughs> right. No, that makes sense. And I'd like to start exposing that stuff to the community as well so they can give some feedback on what we're planning on doing, you know, when that's appropriate. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, we'll have to figure out what's the right way to share that with people because we can't really share the ticket system as far as I know right now. Um, but, um, but, yeah, maybe there's some way to have some kind of live export of. Some kind of report or something that we can share. Um, I I don't know if the ticket system. Uh, a lot of the more sophisticated uh, ticketing companies and like you know, software process automation companies like Atlassian have licenses specifically for open source communities, <coughs> right? They 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 anticipate the need to to accommodate open source communities that might not. You know, have the re the time or the resources or the inclination to spend big money on a per seat licensing basis for you know in our case fifty thousand people. Um, maybe we could reach out to Atlassian and ask them, hey, can we can we have a bunch more seats for our open source developers and see if they're willing to just toss them in? It's for them, it's just flipping bits in a in a database, and it's certainly good PR for them. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think we should talk with somebody who's more knowledgeable about how to set that up. Because I don't know if that means creating developer accounts within our Mycroft account or, you know, something else. But um, but yeah, I agree. We should uh, yeah. we should reach out to them. Uh, I don't think we need to do and that immediately though. Um, you know, let's wait until we've yeah. got a little bit more uh, resources on our hands here. Uh, but we okay. should create a ticket for it. Uh, Ticket to let people look at our tickets. All right, um, what's next? The wake word schema. So, Chris Vair, what um, what did you find out that we need to change? Okay, so um, I just finished moving all of the files out of our 1.5 million entry directory okay. into the directory structure that we've talked about um, previously. So um, I found a, as I, I think Ken and I were talking about this a little bit before the meeting started, I found a, uh, 
a variation of the ls command that didn't take um you know 20 minutes to return <laughs> uh, so uh, it made moving everything um a lot easier Chris, um, let me just interject let me just interject that's not the issue that we could have done that at any time you can, you can just do it from python and you can move them the concern was that data is not backed up and so I was waiting to do that until we had the data backed up. Daniel actually was ready to start that this week because he just got his removable drive on Friday. <coughs> I'm going to have to tell him to not back it up right now because that wake words directory is no longer any good. All I would ask is in the future, if you're going to do something like this that's going to disrupt or move things, please reach out and communicate first. Um, my concern is... All these file names have changed. Their locations have changed. We don't have that data backed up. If there's a mistake or if your correct reference charts are wrong, we lost all that data. That's my concern. Um, I don't care about the day lost yesterday, uh, and I don't really care about telling Daniel to stop and then start rebacking it up when we're ready. But what you did structurally change data we don't have a backup for, and that was my concern. I thought the NAS was braided and striped and everything, so we should have a backup with this. Is that right? Not right? No, what Joshua? you have what you have is a backup should one of the three RAID drives break, you always have the data still available. But when you start moving the data physically around the file system, that's not broken data that you can recover. And that NAS is not backed up. They just got the yeah, mobile title. Yeah, the, the NAS is going to do exactly what you tell it to do. So if you tell it to nuke off a bunch of files, it'll nuke it off. It won't unintentionally lose those files. In other words, and we have had a couple of those Seagate disks cook off. It, like that won't affect your your performance. Um, and we can actually lose one of the entire NASes, and that won't affect your performance. But if you tell it like, hey, nuke all these files, it's going to go ahead and just nuke all the files. And we don't have we don't have a backup of the data. We did buy an external drive and we did mount it it's all ready to go so you you can push those backups anytime you want um but yeah it's it's not we we didn't grab a, a snapshot of the data itself yeah i'll tell daniel to stop that because whatever he's doing right now is of no value but um, i don't understand yeah, the difference between the snapshot of the data and the rating and the striping um okay well let's take that discussion yeah. offline okay yeah, they're just uh, different, they're different issues, yeah. but the, the point is this data this nas is not backed up and now it's no longer in the state it was. So your cross reference charts for what the old file names were and what they're now named, if they're bad, we lost that data. That's okay. Did it right then. <laughs> uh, so how, how are we gonna verify this? Uh, what, what have you done no, so far? To, well, I, I understand that Ken, but I mean, uh, Chris, what have you done so far um, you know, to verify, you know, in terms of like just the file count or things like that. Um, is there any way, um, you know, we can review uh, the operations that occurred? Well, I had just, I just counted all the files that have been moved and there's 1.46 million of them. Um, that's the count of files that are not in the new directory structure. So um, that was my I think 1.5 million is what we had talked about there being in there. <coughs> that sounds yeah, right. 1.6. 1.6, so. But you didn't change the database at all, right? No. Okay, so that's still the system of record. And as long as you have a cross-reference of the old file names and the new file names, we could recover that data. Um, but, yeah, just like I said, in the future, just, just communicate to, to make sure that, you know, because, I mean, you know, I was <laughs> – I mean, my report is yesterday was a terrible day because I found data anomalies when I was building the classifier pipeline, and it turns out that the data is no longer there. <laughs> right. I found that out five minutes before. That could have saved me some time uh, had I known that a priori. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I'm just concerned that um, that data wasn't backed up yet, and we were, like, just getting ready to pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, he might yeah. even start. Well, if I'm you not, want to I'm back not... up the new directory... Um, you can do that instead. We should. I think we should definitely do that. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, let's let's take this offline again. Uh, an issue. Um, figure out how we can avoid this kind of thing in the future. Because 
I, I thought it was pretty clear that we were holding off on doing anything with that data until Ken had a backup of it. So, uh, and, which is the reason we had ordered that extra drive. So clearly something got miscommunicated. Um, so let's, uh, I think we can roll that into the discussion of NASA's not being a backup. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay. it's, it's, yeah, the underlying thinking there is the NASA is a backup for unintentional things. The drive broke or, you know, the computer failed or, um, you know, the one of the NASA's cooked off and stopped working. It's not, it's not a backup for intentional things. A backup is a, a backup is a backup for intentional things. So if you, in, you know, intentionally hit the button and you're like, oh shit, I deleted a bunch of stuff I didn't mean to, that's where the backup comes in. The NAS is good for, you know, overnight, you know, the temperature in the data center got to 200 degrees and drive started failing. The NAS can deal with that. So, um, I apologize for jumping the gun. Um, I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah, and you know we probably don't need 1.5 million samples of that particular <laughs> wake word, but yeah, I mean, on the positive side, I did uh, steal out 122,000 uh, tagged samples and put them in a separate directory as part of the process of trying to figure out what the hell went wrong. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so at least I have most of the tag samples. <laughs> okay. Um, the canonical snap. Uh, Josh, do you want to? Oh, we haven't gone over the actual schema change yet. Oh, I thought you said there wasn't any changes. Okay, so there, there are changes. So let's talk about that. No, this is for the database schema, for the schema. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um, so as I was moving this data, I found out that there's a lot of wake words in this directory that are not in our database. Um, I also 500,000. What? 500,000. I have the actual count. A little over 500,000. Well, I mean, the wake words themselves, like, um, hey, yeah, Tom. They're in, hey, they're, in the, they're in the directory, Yeah. but they're not in the database. And that's because the database update started breaking a year ago. Well, that's not and what I meant. I meant the actual, the, the words themselves that the people utter. Right. They're not, there's wake words. We have files for that are not in our Selenium database right now. Yes, we have about 500,000 words in say, that, that aren't in the yeah. database. We also have a lot of different wake words, not just hey micro, and a lot of those aren't in the database as well. And then we also have data that's in the database that is not in that subdirectory. And I had a breakdown of all of that stuff. I, I have that, I can dig it up somewhere. I have the list of the files that are not represented in the database, the ones that are in the database, not in the uh, in the file system. But were you saying something different than that? So the first part of the wake word file, sample file, is the wake word itself, right? Uh, some of them, not all. It should be, yeah. So they weren't all coded that way. Um, Okay. So one of the things I did was I, so the directory structure is the first part of the wake word um, of the file name is the wake word. And um, there are, there were like, I don't know, a hundred variations of that. First part of the file name, um, or more, and I think there aren't that many variations in the Selenium database right now. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, files that are like, you know, hey Mycroft, blah 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 dot wave that hey Jarvis wake word. There's a bunch of that. Yeah, the, for whatever reason, they just decided to call them all hey Mycroft, and then that coding scheme that you saw with the account ID and the session and the engine and all of that. But the database is the definitive source of record for what they are, whether they've been tagged or not, and what they relate to. Okay. Um, anyway, since it didn't look like there we could have a, a real referential integrity link between the data and this drive, 
in the wake word data as we store it in Selenium today. And also considering people can delete their accounts and delete data, then we still wanted to keep a record of the tagging and the, um, and the files themselves, maybe what, what, what files went into models, that kind of thing. Basically what I did was I removed the, um, I removed the link between the wake word table and the wake word sample table. So basically the wake word sample table is just a representation of what's on this drive. And it may or may not have wake words that are actively being used by users, um, which is what the wake word table has. And it may have account IDs that have been deleted because we'll delete account IDs, but we still wanted to keep the file references. We would delete the files, of course, but we would still have the references so that we could um, look back on how models were built. Does that make sense? I think so. Do you, uh, you had a nice diagram of the system before. Did you update that diagram? I did. And I can share my screen and show everybody. That would be awesome. Okay, so this is the model. I don't know if it's too small if everybody can see it or not. Um, Those five tables are the entire schema? Right now, yeah. Actually, the only ones I've implemented are this one, this one, and this one, because these, whoops, oh yeah, that's a little bigger. Because um, this is part of the tagger, I just haven't implemented that yet. And the model table, you just haven't gotten around to that yet either. So right now it's, wake word, pocket sphinx, and sample. So the sample file, there used to be a link between the wake word file and the sample file. And there used to be a link between the account table, which is not in this diagram, and the account ID. There used to be foreign keys there. Those foreign keys are gone. Why is that? Let me make sure I understand. The sample file is the file that describes the file name and possibly there's a join to a path table somewhere that says, here's how I can find this sample wave file on the file system. That sample should tie to a particular wake word. Hey, Mycroft, hey, Jarvis, maybe not, hey, Mycroft, maybe close to, hey, Mycroft. So where is the link for that sample to the wake word and the final determination of what it was? Well, the wake word itself is still on the table. You've, right. you've actually put the wake word in the table? Yeah. The wake word it was attempted to be is on the table. The problem is that the wake word table, as it exists today, is a mechanism for people to set up wake words on their devices through the UI. Well, that yeah, that's the that's the Cellini wake word table. But the yes. table that comes from the precise database, the wake word table is a table. It's a domain table of the wake words available to the system. Hey, Mycroft, hey, Jarvis, Esmeralda, whatever. And then the ID from that table would be a foreign key into your sample because a sample can only be one wake word at a time. So are you proposing a separate table that is a different from the wake, wake word table that delineates the wake words? Well, I mean, just from a first order normalization perspective, you don't want to duplicate that wake word in every one of those sample rows when you can just have a reference key to it. Otherwise, you're not going to be normalized. You're going to be duplicating data. Yeah, so this is the link that you were talking about having to remove, right? Is that, is that correct, Chris? You know, I think what's happening is that there was an old wake word table and an old wake word present representation in Cellini that was back end oriented. And the precise database is an entity unto itself, which describes the relationships among accounts and wake words and samples on the file system and model types and engine types and all that stuff. And 
So that's a, I think Chris got a little confused because that's a completely different uh, relationship than what this speaks to. It's almost, it's almost like you're trying to overload the old uh, uh, pocket Sphinx wake word stuff uh, with this, but they're two different animals, Chris. So part of the problem is that, okay, um, maybe I need a master. Yeah, just, just create another wake word table, call it wake word prime or precise wake word, and just keep the structure you have now between data and the existing MariaDB and all of its ancillary tables that are basically domain tables for normalization of that data. I, I'm a bit lost. Is, is this something that, that you and the, the two of you guys can take up directly? It sounds like it sounds like we may have had a bit of a fail between East Coast Standard and Central Time in terms of just communicating on this project. Maybe you guys could set up a, a separate call between the two of you, like twice a week until the, all this schema stuff is squared away? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I think Chris is on top of it. I've just, uh, I think the concern is that, Chris, the MariaDB is new to you, and it's a different way of looking at the samples. Um, and this is more the, uh, the back-end UI uh, schema for what you have for Pocket Sphinx and Precise and, and the back-end with uh, setting up wake words that way. But the precise schema is really just a, an entity into itself. Yeah, I mean, I can I can merge the two. He's part. on top of it. I can help him. No, the only faux pas we had was that, that Chris moved data without, you know, reaching out and verifying it was okay first. Uh, but that's that's just an oversight from communication that could happen at any time. Well, I'm I'm concerned. You know, I think you raised some interesting points about the wake word and sample you know, uh, associations. And I thought we, we had gone through this whole schema in detail uh, a while back, and it seemed pretty clear to me what we were trying to accomplish. And there's some features in here that, or there's some features that are not in here that I thought we had discussed, but there are things that can come later as long as the infrastructure is compatible. Things like um, associating information with the sample uh, in terms of like how it was recorded and that sort of thing. Um, but um, but yeah, I think it would probably be a good idea for the two of you at least to go through the whole schema, um, you know, start to finish, and make sure that we really are on the same page, because it's it's pretty easy to uh, talk about something and uh, have us all agree that yes, that's the thing we want, but then we all have different pictures in our heads when we leave the table. Uh, so we thought we were agreeing with one thing, but and we agree to something else. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it'd be good, even if it's, you know, even if you're right, Ken, that, you know, it's, it, it does make sense and this is, this is what you were envisioning. I don't think it hurts to go through and verify that. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll sync up with Chris tomorrow and we'll go over the schema a little bit. Um, I think what we need to do is go through the, because he obviously understands the, uh, the existing schema for the pocket stinks and everything. Uh, I'll just go over the existing schema for the precise wake words and the sample collection and tagging and see how we can uh, merge those. Um, you, it may not be a bad idea initially to keep, uh, I don't know, uh, more classification or more generic classification out of the equation. I know in my case, I've specifically have limited everything to two layers of classification right now. Uh, wake word or not wake word, and high pitched or low pitched voice. And while I can see in my mind's eye that there's a lot of other ways to dice up that data, what I can't do is think about all of that and build the models and code today. So I'm trying to put a stake in the ground with, you know, and saying, let's limit it to this. And then all the other stuff can be added on as we go. And maybe the schema might be a, it might be a good approach with the schema to take that too. Because I can see how classification of the data can get quite complicated and you know, you have a lot of different axes and stuff, and, uh, you know, we really don't need that immediately. So I think really whatever, if we just look at our project that we're trying to do the scope, which is 
to get collection moved over to Celine, which was already in existence, and to get the tagger back up, uh, which was already in existence, and maybe add a high and low pitch classification to the tagger. And let's get through that and get that pipeline moving and get everything working. And then we can worry about the things that we know are coming. Uh, that might we might be served better by doing that by limiting our scope for right now. All right. Uh, well, yeah. Why don't you guys discuss that? Um, I liked the schema that we talked about before, where we did have arbitrary classifications. Now we don't need to implement those because you know we're not working on them right now. But I do. I did like that flexibility of the system. Um, no, but, no, you know, I agree. But we want to limit the scope right now just to get something done. Um, you sure, know, I'd like to get moving and, and get you know users back on the uh, in the process flow, right. and then we can enhance. You know, let, let's get it working first. Let's optimize it second, and then let's clean it up third. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, can set up a set up a meeting for some time um, soon. Uh, I'd like to actually go over the schema as well with you guys. All right, so Michael, um, Chris and I are usually available 24-7. <laughs> you and Josh, okay. not so much. So right. Why don't you uh, just set a meeting up uh, at some time that works for you, and I'm sure Chris and I can make it. Okay. How about tomorrow morning? Fine. Okay, great. I'll set something up. Uh, so I think that covers it for our agenda. Um, you can stop screen sharing if you want, Chris. And you still want to cover that snap. Oh, right. You're right. I missed the snap. So let's talk about that. Uh, that would be Josh. Sorry, I'm wandering around my shop and I forgot where I set my phone. Um, the canonical sent us a note and said, hey, guys, we love your snap. We want to do cool things with it. But there is here are the things that are to be desired. I forward that off to everybody. Like, I don't know what you guys want to do about it in terms of resource allocation, if it's priority or not. I just wanted to lay it out there that we, you know, they they've um, reached out and they're doing doing good work in their uh, they obviously want to work with us. I just want to make sure we're responsive. Yeah, I, I, those comments that they had looked like they were asking if there was something that they could help us with respect with respect to I think the alpha notes that we put in the um, in the store, right? All of those seem to be referencing things that we said. Hey, this is too slow, or this is you know sometimes doesn't work. Just ignore this warning or that kind of thing. Uh, now, so my question to the, our team here is. Are those things that are specific to the canonical snap, or is that uh, are those sort of generic problems? Um, the first one is the um, micro readiness issue as a whole. So okay. you know, uh, so that's not the snap related. The the OS errors for pip installations that is the snap, um, and the proposed solution of just including everything in the snap doesn't work because people can install and remove um, skills and, and which need to be able to install um, Python packages. Um, so we can definitely, um, that's something that, that they can assist with. Um, yeah. I think the other things are probably going to require us working with them, um, and so it'll absolutely be really useful to have um, their assistance on it. But it's it's going to require time on our end as well, um, uh, okay. which you know obviously we want to spend time on it. But in terms of when we do that, it's the other question. Okay. Um, the other thing with the snap is that the. Uh, we should be able to, to package the GUI into the snap, mm. um, theoretically, uh, but I haven't done any attempt at that. So. Right. 
Um, but I think that's a limitation of the snap at the moment. Because you know, if you if you launch it, particularly if you launch it from the desktop icon, it just runs in the background and looks like nothing's happening. Um, and so then you kind of have to explicitly tell people to go and launch it by typing micro into a command line, which is exactly why we are moving away <laughs> towards Snap so that people don't have to do that sort of stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think we need some kind of graphical representation for users to show that, that right. things are happening. OK, that's a, that's a good point. Um, but that's it's Would also like the plasma ticket. big screen stuff be any help in that? Um, well, yeah, so the, the QT GUI should work now because um, it runs natively in, in Ubuntu 20.04. So we just have to bump the snap to the core um, 20 base, which is roughly equivalent to running your snap inside Ubuntu 20.04. Mm -hmm. Means that it has access to all the same packages and stuff. Um, I imagine that we could do this. Yeah, I'm not sure about how KV would work. Uh, I haven't, yeah. OK. Um, all right, that's good. So we'll have to have a, that's more of a, I think, a business discussion as to whether, you know, what our priority with respect to that is. Um, a lot of which will depend on the community's interest in uh, having a snap uh, for their own development purposes. Well, I think, personally, I think that the, the interest in the snap is going to come from outside our current community. I think the people in our current community have, have you know, they're using Microsoft on Raspberry Pi or they're cloning it, you know, onto their Linux installations already. And so they're generally happy with that. Um, I I think it's most likely that the snap is a way of gaining larger distribution rather than a development environment. Should be able to use it for development, but I, I think I think so. The the place where I think that there's um, uh, it, it, so we've got a bunch of stuff that we have to do that we're not paying any attention to right now on the operating system uh, and like memory management and disk management side in order to ship an IoT device, right? The, the Mark II is an IoT device that should run, you know, it should ideally run headless, right? Because we want to run a version with no screen and then it needs to get its updates. It needs to manage its compact flash drive in an intelligent way so it doesn't read write it until it's dead the way that, that Pycroft does. Um, like there's a lot of overhead type stuff that we rely on in our IoT device in order for that thing to work. My understanding of where Canonical wants to go with this, and maybe I'm wrong, is that Canonical wants their, their snap packaging and their operating system, their IoT version of their OS, to be a like ready out of the box, like, you know, hey, um, Acme Corp wants to ship a, um, a, who was, I was talking to a guy who was doing a smart scale the other day that has a, in their case, Alexa integrated. Like Acme Corp wants to ship a smart scale. They, you know, they need an operating system for that scale that connects back to a series of APIs and allows you to, you know, manage your, your you know, track your weight on a day-to-day -day basis. And they also want it to talk and tell you, you know, one at a time, right? Hey, are you weighing a car or, you know, whatever the feedback is they want on their scale. And, uh, you know, they want to be able to just simply say, add the Mycroft snap and boom, now you've got a voice enabled scale for the bathroom that, you know, shames you for being fat. Um, you know, the, the right now, in order to do that, companies are having to, you know, actually, I don't know what they do because we never really did the, the first engineering step that I would do today with an IoT device, which is investigate the state of the art. I'm sure there are companies out there that provide a turnkey IoT operating system with, you know, updates and everything all, you know, right out of the box. You can just load the operating system on your IoT device and focus on your application. My understanding is that's what Ubuntu wants to be. And, you know, by, by facilitating the snap, you know, when we ship the Mark II, if we can ship it on a, a Ubuntu instance that doesn't require a bunch of a bunch of customization and allows us to do updates and you know deals with 
you know, bad sectors in the CF automatically and recovery, you know, at factory reset and all that crap right out of the box. Like that's going to be a benefit to us because we continue reinventing the wheel over and over again on the operating system side. And frankly, it's a it's a large part of why, you know, the Mark II sitting on my countertop here at the house doesn't work. Right. It's not that we changed the software. It's that there was some problem with the CF. Sorry, that was a bit ranty. Um, but I agree in terms of, yeah, like I, I see it as a distribution mechanism more than a development environment. Like, and that extends, as you say, to, to the IoT space. Um, I still think it's worth us talking about whether that's the right solution for the Mark II. Um, I think we've kind of talked about that before. Like, you know, maybe it is, and maybe the fact that it, it, um, it serves as a testing ground for, for other IoT purposes, um, you know, strengthens the case for it being that way. But similarly, we can easily, because we are in contr complete control of the device, um, you know, we can go other more flexible options as well. Um, yeah. All right, well, we haven't done, a, I think, a serious look into what it would, uh, what it would mean to use, you know, the canonical version as our update process and and all that, right? There's, there's a lot yeah. of you know pretty obvious factors that we have to look at. Um, but uh, but if they are, as Josh says, if they are prepping this to be the IoT version of the OS, then hopefully they have figured out all of those things, right? Like what happens when an update fails and or power you know goes off at the wrong time and all that kind of stuff, you know. You know, uh, they, yeah, they need well, to know that snapshots have a really good rollback process. So they actually keep snapshots of your previous, um, you know, working states, so that mm -hmm. you can, if something does fail, you can roll back to, to the previous version quite nicely. Um, so there is some some cool stuff like that in there, um, but there are other reasons that I can see for not going in that direction. But sure. I, I think it's a broader discussion than. Yeah. Michael, does our does our device have a battery backup? Well, that's going to be implementation dependent, but uh, I see Derek. No, 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 no. Okay, no, so Linux not... doesn't do real good with power outages. Have you tried just unplugging it and seeing if it powers back up again? Oh, no. sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Depends on if it was in the middle of writing something important. Yeah, it gets very, yeah. definitely get variable behavior in that case. You can, yeah, you can yeah, break you, it. Yeah, really easy. Yeah, you, you can't. You can't. Uh, the the battery situation is is regulatory not not technology like the second you add a lipo to it it's hazmat and now air shipping becomes a bitch shipping across borders becomes a problem like duh, 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 duh. plus if we add a battery into it you know or technically you know that would make it a mobile device and i and you know for the if any of the asshats over at voice tech are listening into this <laughs> it's not a mobile it's not a mobile device flipping more on. By mistake, you're right, so, you're right. It's yeah. a mobile device, no battery. <laughs> Which isn't to say that I would even take that into consideration because their patent sucks anyway. But, you know, it, right now, yeah. right now, yeah, adding a battery just adds a bunch of complexity that we don't need. <laughs> well, Michael, if you want me to describe RAID, it'll take about two minutes. Uh, what will take two minutes? Describing RAID. Oh, uh, I don't need that to be explained to me. You guys can talk about that okay. offline. Um, so anything else on the agenda that people like to discuss? Oh, I know. Hey, uh, we've got this ticket system it's called JIRA. Um, before this meeting, everyone was going to uh, update their JIRA tickets. Uh, we're at uh, almost an hour at this point, so I don't want to go through those in uh, excruciating detail right now. But I'll just ask, um, did everybody get a chance to update their Euro tickets uh, yesterday? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I, I had the opportunity but did not take advantage of it. I will do that. Um, I am continuing <laughs> to work on I am continue. Well, I did load a ton of tickets on Friday. But um, I am continuing to work on the project rollover um, Wi-Fi thing. I was able to. I was able to get a persistent reverse shell off of their network so I can now piddle around with their Wi-Fi until I get it squared and where it needs to be. Okay. Uh, did that uh, relate to the uh, getting the Spotify skill to work on their network as well? No, oh. that doesn't have anything to do with me. Uh, but after playing with their after right. playing with their networks their network security a little bit on my side, 
it, I would be, you need to probably ping their network team who's telling the engineers that all of the, all of the uh, outbound TCP connections are allowed when that is just flat not true. I had to, you know, I had to reach in. Okay. And, so that's an and, internal problem yeah, for them. Um, it yeah, may be, but it, it, I'm not guaranteeing it, but you know, it could be that okay. they simply are banning connections to Spotify on the, at the network level. No, no, the Spotify thing's different. It's a package issue. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, so, well, I was curious about that. Um, so the Spotify offline, um, I, I didn't even know that we were messing around with that. Did that, that actually work on the, the Qt version? Uh, the local local playback, yeah. So not offline, but... Oh, um, what does what's what's local mean then? As in... So on a Pycroft, if you use the Spotify skill, it can control another Spotify device. So if you've got Spotify, oh, computer, for example. No, oh, right, right, right. Okay. No, I, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas I thought it was like um, I thought you were talking about like an offline mode or something like where you can. Oh no, that would be cool. <laughs> no, no. Not yet. What not yet. You can do on certain devices, you can download tracks and. Yeah, yeah. Offline. Mode. Okay, sorry, I was confused. Never mind. <laughs> but yeah, so we we they've. Well, Arcade has compiled a, 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 a custom um, package of Libre, Libre Spot, I want to say, um, which, yeah, allows for the device itself to be the, the Spotify device as opposed to, a, you know, another device being the thing that's playing music, um, which is obviously what you want in a smart speaker is for it to be playing the sound. Um, it, but it relies on a, a few other packages, which which currently aren't available in our Pycroft based installation. So, um, yeah, there's a few ways to go, which I kind of outlined in chat. But okay, got it. Weird. Uh, okay, Michael, are you talking? I I was just flapping my lips. It's all it's all right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's go over this tomorrow. Um, and we'll start with the Jira issues and just check out the uh, the currently defined sprints and take a look at that stuff. Okay, um, any last minute stuff we need to bring up? Nope. All right. So we'll go ahead with our regularly scheduled meeting tomorrow. Cool. Right. Okay. See everybody then. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Be good.